Well, welcome and hello to everybody. We're having a conversation today on um, the constitutional amendments, 14 of them that are coming up in this year's election. And um, we have at CSL Dallas, we have a democracy and um, advocacy program that we've really come to understand how important spirituality is in engaging with democracy and advocacy. And as spiritual people, we don't want to um, not participate. So I'm Dr. Petra Weldis. I'm the spiritual director of the Center for Spiritual Living, CSL Dallas Center for Spiritual Living. And with me is Sherry Wood, one of our spiritual coaches. Um, and she's um, intimately involved in our democracy and advocacy program. And most importantly, Sherry has been involved in the political system here in Texas for many, 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 many years. And she knows a whole lot more about it than I do. <laughs> and so when Sherry and I were talking about this and she said, hey, we got to talk about um, these amendments. I'm like, what? What do you mean constitutional amendments? And um, and I don't really like get how this all works. And so I learned a whole boatload of stuff from you, Sherry. <laughs> we had that conversation. Yeah. I, was, I have no idea. So 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 we're going to start with a little bit of an overarching conversation about why this is so important. And then in a minute, when we're done with that, we'll dive into the amendments. And what we're going to do is really talk about the amendments. First of all, how they're written, how we can understand something about them. And then also talk about if if something is in alignment or not in alignment with our global vision and the ways in which we believe that is really uh, our spirituality is is moving out into the world um, and that world that works for everyone. We're, mm -hmm. we're really committed to a world that works for everyone. Yeah. And so every time we vote, we're participating in the possibility of creating a world that works for everyone. Um, and so. Sherry. Yes. So, so first of all, let's talk about what happens in these, these elections between presidential elections. Um, and yeah, why is it that people don't, okay, I'm just going to out myself. Okay. It wasn't, it wasn't really truthfully, it wasn't until a couple of years ago probably in the last six, that I even understood that I was actually supposed to be voting in those elections. I'm kind of embarrassed to say that. And um, and now I see some of the, the fallout of all of that, or at least the implication of all of that. And so maybe you could talk about why do you think people don't vote and, and what's why should we? Absolutely. So you're not alone in that you're... Um not understanding or even awareness of these off-year elections and why they're important. And so like the last time we had a constitutional amendment election was in 2021, and only 9% of the registered voters in the entire state of Texas voted. Wow. So you can see that, is that you're- Is that a number? Like, do you happen to know what the like approximate Mm, I, you know, I don't have that approximate number, but I do know that it is very small based on the number of registered voters. So you can see that your individual vote has a lot more impact, right? When it's in, just like it does in city elections when there's less of a turnout. So mm -hmm. overall, um, you know, your voice is gonna have a greater impact because there's less people voting. Right. I'm going to okay. look up how many registered voters Texas has. Okay. Because nine percent, obviously, ten percent is a, you know, it's yeah. easy to know what ten percent is, and so um, because that just feels like a ridiculously small number. Well, it is, and the you know I think what keeps to ask answer your question about what keeps people from voting in these elections is that they're more complicated. You know, when we have candidates on the ballot, it's pretty easy to identify by party or label or, you know, issues or that kind of thing. When you have these kind of um, constitutional amendments that are more detailed in nature, you actually have to spend some time 
studying, maybe researching, because there's there's pros and there's cons, right, to every one of these. And so it just takes more time. And frankly, a lot of people don't have the time um, or the willingness in some instances to actually do that work. Well, and I've truthfully believed either I could walk in and just read the statement and make mm -hmm. a decision, right? Yeah. Which mm -hmm. I have noticed in the past <laughs> it, I've, and, and in and states where I've lived where they've used referendums, mm -hmm. I have been equally mistaken with right. the way it was written that I actually understood what was going on. And yeah. I have in retrospect discovered that I voted for things that I actually wasn't, uh, that I wasn't uh, for, but with the way it was, you know, there was like that immediate, well, of course, but there's yeah. so much in, involved. And so, yeah, the time it takes to understand it and um, to learn about candidates, learn about issues, but there's so many resources now on the internet. I mean, we're going to talk about this um, uh, Texas brochure that's from the League of Women Voters. It's totally bipartisan or nonpartisan or however you want to say that. It's just, here's what it is. Here's what it means. Here's what people are saying pro. Here's what people are saying you know, for and against. Right. And it's at least a modicum of information and in anything that, you know, we would, that one would not would be uncertain about you could you just then explore that one referendum yeah. or that one amendment so there's tons of information now much more easily accessible yes okay so here's an astonishing piece of information okay 17 million mm. is registered voters okay a lot of 17 million if 10 percent of them voted statewide that means a million seven hundred people, seven hundred thousand people made decisions for seventeen million yeah. people. Yeah, right. That's mind-boggling. Yes, it is. Uh, yeah, and as spiritual beings who uh, practice the science of mind and a new thought philosophy, we understand that responsibility, personal responsibility, and our responsibility for our choices is very, 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 very much a part of what we understand as spiritual beings we're doing. And our choices, it, we're co-creating life. And if we're, you know, if my choice has been not to be bothered, then I'm really, I'm not taking responsibility. And I, my choice is I'm letting somebody else take responsibility. And right. I may not, I may or may not like their choice. <laughs> well, true. And part of our global vision is a world that works for everyone, right? And so in order to contribute to that, we actually have a responsibility to engage in the process of whatever that looks like. And we live in a democracy and, you know, in the United States and in um, Texas. So we have a responsibility um, to actually engage and be informed citizens. Yeah. Well, and you think about how many of the votes in the last, I don't know how many years, some of them have been just so close and people say, well, what, what does my vote count? Mm -hmm. Well, if 1% of the people who didn't vote voted could potentially easily shift a vote. Right. Um, and um, the idea that that is how we exercise our choice and our responsibility. And then the other thing I think about is when it's this small numbers, if a, a group or whoever put the, an amendment forward is so committed to it, right, they're likely to um, enlist a lot of people to go vote. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. Right? That makes yes. sense to me. And um, And so if we're not informed, then we've and we're not voting, then we're not taking responsibility for how that vote actually plays out. Yes. Well, and the other thing to consider and be aware of is like, unlike many other states, um, the Texas Constitution does not allow for citizen-led uh, ballot initiatives or referendums. And so this really is one of the only ways that we can directly impact and influence uh, what becomes in public policy um, because 
this is the way our particular constitution <clears throat> is constructed, given the fact that it was written in 1876 and has been amended over 500 times, um, it, it, which is mind boggling. And it's like, but this is the way that we govern. And so it's important to understand that um that besides electing our representatives that this is one of the most direct ways you can have an impact on public policy yeah and that's a piece that i think is i mean it, it's not it's mind-boggling and it's amazing to me because what the end net result is is that things that could be public policy end up being voted into the constitution, mm -hmm. which means that <clears throat> policy can be changed by people who are running the policies. And, you know, just like you do in a business, you have a policy, you know, we're going to open at 10 o'clock in the morning. Oh, wait, we really need to open at nine or a 12. I mean, you, if it's written in your bylaws, you have to go through a whole, uh, this whole voting process, mm -hmm. which just seems it's, it's, it seems amazing, but of course it does in fact, um, uh, it seems to me that it has it creates a veil between the voters and what they're voting for, and it becomes even that much more important for voters to take responsibility to learn the system, learn what's up to vote, and then vote their conscience. Vote yeah. what is in their heart, what their you know values tell them, what spirit what their spirituality tells them. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that you can't make an impact with your uh, spirituality or your values if you don't actually participate. Yes. And as I said, I am reluctant to um, to really acknowledge how completely uninformed about all of this I've been in Texas. And, um, and I'm taking responsibility for changing that. Good for <laughs> you. <laughs> Just one at a time. <laughs> having these conversations and absolutely helping yes. educate. So there's lots and lots of ways of getting information. And it always has seemed to me that the League of Women Voters, right, they've been so clear. Our job is to give you information. <laughs> yes. Right. And I love that. And mm -hmm. uh, and so that's a place that I've also gone in the past it was for candidates, for other things, other issues. Um, and so I'm sure there's other places. Is there is there any other that you feel like is that kind of just information without being uh, politically um, motivated or partisan motivated in one form or another? That's this is the one that I know of. Yeah, the, I think that's probably that that's my go to because they are so well informed and respected because they have a great track record. And so um, they also have the um, research arm that really can present both the the for and against the pro and con the history. So I think they provide such a good informational base. Um, the other one that I have used is called Ballotpedia like Wikipedia, except it's yeah. called Ballot, B-A-L-L-O-T-pedia. Yes. And they also do a good job of laying out what the issue is and then the, the for and the against. Um, so that that's another source that I have used. Okay. And and uh, Ballotpedia, Ballotpedia.org, .com, do we know? Or, dot .org, yes. Mm -hmm. dot .org. Sure you know, Google it, Ballopedia. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and so that because because we don't want somebody to tell us how to vote, but we oh. do we do want to recognize that that voting is a significant exercise in taking responsibility for being a citizen and a way of exercising our choices. Right. Well, and the thing with like constitutional amendments, it's not so clear cut because a lot of these um appear as, as special interests, like they're very specific to an, an issue or what could become a policy. And so you really have to, you know, weigh both sides and see where you land on that. Um, or even whether or not you want it written in the constitution or whether exactly. you 
being one of force right. the governing bodies to make policy because once it's in the constitution that's a whole nother thing so i have to plug in my ipad hang on just a second okay running low but let me ask you this question is it what happens if if, if a um an amendment gets in gets approved mm -hmm. um, do they ever get does it, is there ever a Texas amendment to the Constitution, a proposed amendment that says, let's remove amendment number 47 because it's no longer applicable or we don't like it anymore? Does that ever happen? You know, not that I'm aware of. And the reason why is because to get an, a constitutional amendment on the ballot to begin with, it has to pass two thirds of the House of Representatives and two thirds of the Senate, right? And so it's very unlikely that that would ever be <laughs> retracted. And then it would have to go to the voters again, and the majority of voters would have to vote to remove it from the Constitution. And so, you know, unlike our US Constitution that only has been amended 27 times, um, it's, it becomes entrenched yeah. right into that body of work that we call the Texas constitution. And there, there might be workarounds, like there's a couple that we'll get to here that are very specific. But um, big picture wise, I'd say, that, yeah, the chances of that are pretty small. Well, yeah. And then, of course, once it's there, then what happens is then, then public opinion sways a different direction. Perhaps it's no longer applied but it's still always there to just right. pull it back out again and say, no, no, we don't like that anymore. We don't like the way public the, it's gone. We're going to come back and enforce this. Um, and we certainly know how that has worked um, in the situation of marginalized people, people of color, all kinds of craziness where things, you know, and even with um, homophobia, things that have been kind of pulled back out again that weren't being acted on. And then all of a sudden they're acted on again. Right. So, well, it's a very archaic process. I mean, yeah. it's not it's not flexible. It's very archaic and it's what we have to work with. Yeah, and it's the process we have. And so we can rail yeah. against it all we want. Right. You know, so okay. And or, or we can really educate ourselves, take responsibility for educating ourselves and then um making the choices that are in alignment with our values and our spirituality. Yes. So that's what we're up to here. We're going to then we're going to take a minute. We're going to take a few minutes to go through these amendments. And mm -hmm. um, some of them are pretty innocuous. Some of them are like, yeah, that seems like a no brainer. Others of them maybe are not in alignment with our values of um, of the global vision. We're going to talk about that. Some of them we might really want to question. Do we actually want that codified yes. in the um constitution sherry and i are going to just talk about it we're going to explore it but you know truthfully anybody everybody you guys who are um watching this you have to make your own decisions um everything is about us making our own decisions based on the guidance of our own consciousness our own conscience our own values um and uh so yeah so we're going to explore these a little bit um and we're working off the League of Women Voters Texas Voter Guide that, that's um, in the description on the Facebook uh, description of this video. There's a link to that. There's also a link to League of Women Voters Texas. At League of, you can go to League of Women Voters Dallas. So I live in Dallas County and I live in the city of Dallas, where if you live someplace else, um, if you live anywhere in the country, you can find the League of Women Voters for your uh, specific state, probably also for metropolitan areas. Um, I don't know how finely, you know, but that would be worth checking into. Clearly, this particular conversation is for people who are voting in Texas at this particular time. But hopefully it also inspires people who are not in Texas. I mean, I'm sure you have, there's voting going on every November 7th. Isn't that right? Isn't, Sherry, isn't it pretty much every? Yeah, there's probably something going on in every state in, in off election years. I would, yeah, that's probably a safe bet, yeah. And so it's not just, and it's not just in the second, in the, 
in the middle year where then ha- um, uh, people are elected to the federal government or different yeah, things. Midterm elections, yeah. Right. Right. But, but there are there are referendums and all these kinds of things. And so it's really worth, I mean, when Sherry said to me, what about these 14 amendments? I've said, what vote? What, what? We're voting? <sighs> I'm so What are you talking about? <laughs> you speak a foreign language to me. <laughs> So, my God, I am going to learn about this. I'm completely capable of learning about it. I'm convinced you are. (laughs) Okay, Proposition 1. Here we go. Proposition 1. There's 14 of this. The first one is the amendment protecting the right to engage in farming, ranching, timber production, horticulture, and wildlife management. Clearly having to do with the state that the state of Texas could allow um, that, uh, so establish a right for people and businesses to do all those things on property they own or lease. The state of Texas could still allow state agencies or, or local governments to regulate these practices. Um, and so the, um, there's, so this is taking the regulatory oversight of farming, ranching, timber production, horticulture, and wildlife management out of the hands of state and federal governments and putting it in the hands directly of the people who are farming, ranching, timber timber um, harvesting, horticulture, or wildlife management. Is that, Am I reading that correctly, Sherry, do you think? Um, well, actually, the state could step could still allow state agencies or local governments to regulate the practices. Um, This just would prevent cities from what they consider Uh over-regulation of agricultural uh, practices. Because one of the arguments as for the reason this is needed, that is the population grows and the demand for food grows, that, agriculture should be free to um, move, to move about in ways that um, they deem the best practices, basically. And, and do we deem that they're using their best practices? Well, that's on the other side of, of the argument, because this also would um, extend to agribusinesses, which make up a bulk of the food production in the state of Texas. And they have their own set of best practices that might be different from the farmer in South Texas, right? And so this, the concern is, is this would remove from local governments that ability to um, do what's best for their particular community which might be different, you know, in the Valley than it is in West Texas. So it it goes back to a little bit more of the local local control. Uh Uh-huh. And it doesn't say anything about federal control. No, this is simply state and local. Federal stuff is still in alignment. Things like um, something on the Endangered Species Act, something around the use of pesticides, if they are... um, federally mandated regulations, Mm -hmm. uh, those things all stay in place. So, okay, so this is really about local regulation. Yes, Um, that's correct. And so- One of the questions is that, is there a um, immediate need for this? What's the, what precipitated this? You know, why, who thought this was necessary, I guess. And so that's also part of it. Is there actual an immediate need for this? or not, or is this like one of those things somebody thought is a good idea to prevent something right. that actually isn't even an issue at the current moment? Right. And is the is the is what's need is the concern we are eventually going to be overregulated and we don't want to be, or is the concern we are going to be regulated according to some other part of the state of Texas or according to some other size or type of um, farming business and it's going to impact us. So these are the these are all the questions, right? So if this is something that interests you, those of you who are watching this, those would be some of the things you would want to research. Who put this forward? 
And is it an immediate need or are they prophylactically thinking, I'm going to keep this from happening. So I'm going to make sure that it can't be, um, uh, it, can, it can't impact me. Um, right. And, you know, and I know there's a huge, huge, huge conversation about how soil management is a massive possibility for climate change that the, man, the, the management of soil very, very, very differently than we do in um, today's agribusiness actually is what's required to se sequester enormous amounts of carbon um, into back into the earth. They've proven time and time and time again that it is a, um, a very, very he healthy way of doing it. It's very healthy for the soil. It's very healthy production. But again, who's regulating that? What if the state decides just to regulate that and I, as a farmer, don't believe in it or don't choose to do it? Right. And that's the other part is that this leaves a pretty broad interpretation of what's an accept what's the acceptable uh, practice. So uh, that was also one of the um, arguments against this particular amendment that I read. Yeah, and, and where when when best practices change, are people taking them up? Exactly. Right, because best practices could be what I did 50 years ago or 100 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And isn't necessarily what's best practice when we think about the long-term health of our food. And I'll never forget a doctor who said to me, you do understand that the oranges that you're eating for vitamin C have only 20% of the amount of vitamin C in that they had 50 to 75 years ago. And it's all about our farming practices. The soil just isn't. Um, strong enough to actually provide what the oranges need to to have that much um, vitamin C in them. I was like, okay, that was a whole piece of information I didn't know, yeah. right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, so don't go down the rabbit hole, you guys. I mean, you can actually get so lost in these things that it's overwhelming and you throw up. At, let me just be clear. I throw up my hands <laughs> like I have no idea. I, I'm just not going to vote. But that it feels like a cop out to me now. I want to educate myself enough and I'm just going to do the best I can. I'm going to make the best decision that I can given what I can know and find out. And then, but because choosing not to choose, yeah, that's a choice too, yeah, right? That, right. That is a choice. Right. Um, okay. Proposition two, the constitutional amendment authorizing a local option exemption from ad valorem taxation. I can't even say the word. <laughs> a mouthful. A local option, the constitutional amendment authorizing a local option exemption from an ad valorem taxation by a county or municipality of all or part of the appraised value of real property used to operate a child care facility. So this would allow for lower property taxes on some child care centers, uh, and they would uh, benefit, this would be applied to child care that is owned or rented where at least 20% of the children enrolled receive subsidized child care services. So from that, I, I surmise that this is for child care um, centers that are operating um, where the um, where it's a lower income, lower socioeconomic area because the taxes are lower, the people that are might be under the poverty line. And so this is to help them not have to pay property taxes. Would is that what you think, Sherry, what this is about? Yes, I do. And um, just to give a little more background, there are just like there's food deserts in a lot of urban areas, there's actually child care deserts. Um, they've identified 18 alone in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, so it's not just the rural areas or the, you know, lesser populated areas. This actually um, is true in our urban areas as well. Um, and, and the other part of this is that the pandemic level uh, federal support that child care centers have received actually ended September 30th. And because of what's going on in Congress, uh, that has not been renewed. So this actually has a little more urgency to it that could actually provide um, some relief and resources for these child care centers that are operating in lower income areas. And the thing to realize is this still need, would need to be approved by the city or the county in which that child 
care center operates. So if they operate in Dallas County, Dallas County would still have to approve this. This just gives the cities and counties the ability to provide this property tax relief for a child care center. Yeah, and one would think that if uh, one had, if they had to pay a little bit less property tax, they could either lower the cost to people, mm -hmm. right. right? And maybe as importantly, maybe more importantly, actually pay their childcare people. Absolutely, they could up level the their staff. They could provide training. There's all kinds of things because. Um, as we know, the child uh, care workers and are usually some of the, our lower paid um, people in that industry, so. Okay, and the arguments against, I think are interesting, um, that lowering the property tax for one type of business could increase the tax burden for other property owners. I'm not quite sure how, it doesn't, it's not raising the taxes for anybody else. Um, so, so that I don't quite understand that lower property taxes would reduce taxes raised to fund counties and cities. Yes, that, that would be true. And so that would be part of the trade off. Uh, um, and potentially if, um, people are making a little bit more money or the, um, the, uh, people are able to use the, um, child care that actually creates for a better workforce that creates for people being able to work more. So there's, yeah, I mean, that's part there's of the offsets. Yeah. You would, you would assume there's offsets and the yeah. amount of property tax that we're talking about is probably minuscule, you know, in a, in a metropolitan area like Dallas or Fort Worth, um, it might be more in a local, smaller community, but it's probably not a huge amount of money that we're talking about. Well, and also when you think about how much the value of properties have gone up and the property taxes have gone up mm -hmm. so significantly um, that, yeah, I mean, especially in metropolitan areas, I would think that this would actually have a larger benefit to the cent child care center with a smaller offsetting consequence to that larger community around them, that the smaller the community, the more the change in tax revenue could, you know, might actually have an impact. But when we're talking about a multi multi-million dollar budget and a few child care centers, um, and again, if it's a world that works for everyone, it especially has to work for women with children. And we know how many people have, how many women have left the workforce during the pandemic because they couldn't find child care. They were trying to work from home and raise their kids at the same time, regardless of whether they had a partner or not, a spouse or not, it has documentably um, uh, landed on women. Um, and we still have so many help wanted signs everywhere. And we have a 3.4% unemployment rate, which is basically considered a fully, fully employed workforce, um, allowing women to work and have good solid childcare um, feels incredibly important to a world that works for everyone. So, you know, that, so these are some of the ways in which we would, we would want to think through these propositions um, and, and then decide where, where we land on them. Right. Yeah. Okay. So if you're just joining us, we're just reminding ourselves that just because there's not a presidential election, these elections in the, in between are super important this year in Texas. There are 14 constitutional amendments that have to be um, I voted in or voted no. And, um, and as Sherry said earlier in our um, broadcast here, uh, last year, 9% of the population of Texas of registered voters, of 17 million registered voters, only 9% voted. And that means le uh, less than 1 million 700 people, 700,000 people made that decision for the for the entire state. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, so we're really, uh, so I'm educating myself and learning to take responsibility for, for voting. There's early voting, early voting starts today. You're gonna early vote for uh, all the way up until the third or fifth of November. You can mail in vote. All you have to do is educate yourself, which we are trying to do. <laughs> I am desperately trying to do. That's why I have Sherry here. <laughs> okay. Shall we carry on? Proposition three. Carry on. This Are is a good one. There's 14 <laughs> of them. Hang in there. Constitutional amendment prohibiting the imposition of an individual wealth or net worth tax, including a tax on the difference between the assets and liabilities of an individual family. 
This would put in the constitution a, a prohibiting a wealth tax, um, which is a tax on a va the value of a person's assets, less their liabilities. So what they own versus what they owe. Assets may include cash, bank deposits, shares of stock, equipment, real estate, pension plans, money, funds, and trusts. Yeah, this is one of those that just makes my head go, okay, who and why did someone think this was necessary? And I did do more research on this one, and it's not even being considered. Like, no one has even brought this up as a possibility of another um, form or stream of revenue. And so it's just one of those that I, you know, I think, I don't know what someone's thinking was, but it's, um, first of all, it would be nearly impossible or very difficult at least to administer it, to, um, you know, to determine someone's assets and then liabilities and all of that. That would just be a very cumbersome process. Um, and just because someone looks like they have significant wealth on paper, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that they would have cash flow that then could be taxed. And, you know, for example, farmers or um, mm -hmm. retired people. And um, so to me, this is just one of those that makes my head go, what? Why are we so, doing you know, this? Why are we doing this? It feels like one of those that somebody wanted to make a splash and say, oh, you know, I I propose that we can't, you know, tax wealth and, you know, and um, I'm all for people that are entrepreneurs and that kind of thing and I'm protecting. So I don't I don't know. I don't know who proposed this or or the impetus for it, but it just seems like one of those like, do we even need this? Right. And, I can't come up with a reason why we would actually want to have this in our constitution. Well, I wondered if it, it because there continues to be at the federal level conversations about well um, taxing the wealthy one percent, right? And so that's you know that's a whole nother the billionaire tax that right. There's a lot of conversation and certain circles and certainly at the federal level um, right. that so so I wonder if this is a well, even if you guys decide to do that, we're saying no here in Texas. And so it's just an interesting thing, right? And and there's and there's no opportunity to really think about the um the um um the one percent, um, the misalignment of wealth and how wealth continues to grow. Um, and um, yeah, I don't really care for this idea of assets versus liabilities because it could be it would be actually applied to everybody. Right. Uh, and as you say, there there's a lot of places where that's going to be gray and or it's going to be challenging to think about. Um, and um, um, yeah, this, it, yeah, it feels like fun. something that's already addressed at the federal level. I mean, that's why we have the Internal Revenue you know, Service, basically, is because that applies to everybody. This feels like this was just one of those singular things like, oh, no, not in Texas. We're not going to do this in Texas. And like you said, it could have absolutely, I hadn't thought about that, come out of the conversation that's going on at the national level. That that does make How sense. How those two things would play out doesn't even address yeah. No. So yeah. So so for me, ultimately, it's a poorly worded, poorly ideated, poorly yeah. idea preposition. Um, and um, while there may be some sense of ur urgency on some people's part, um, is it is it on it is it on the majority of people's part? Right. That's the other thing I think about constitutional amendments. Does it really affect the majority? Does it really affect? The, the citizens of Texas, or how small of a group of people are we talking about? Right. Yeah, it's just uh, um, it's just an interesting. It oh, and of course it will. Uh, um, yeah, it's just an interesting thing, and one has to decide. You know, I tell this to people all the time. People who say, "Ah, my taxes have gone up. I hate paying taxes. I hate paying taxes to the government. I hate blah blah blah." And especially local taxes. You know, my son's a first responder. Your local taxes pay his salary. Your local taxes pay for the teachers. The local taxes that we pay on property taxes, they're not federal taxes. They stay here, right here in 
our um, community and they pay for very real things that we need to have. Um, and um, it's it's and then the state of Texas has a huge budget surplus and one wonders, you know, what that's being spent on. And so um, we get a little wigged out about taxes. Of course, I was raised European and in Europe, you pay a lot of taxes, but you get a lot for it. Right. And, and that's it's a whole nother mindset. It's a whole nother frame of reference. And if you we paid as much in taxes as we pay for health insurance, we would get a whole boatload more services than just the health insurance that we pay extraordinary amounts for. Um, so it's all taxation has that also that weird, it's like that weird hot button thing. Like you have immediate yes, yes. or an immediate no. Mm. <laughs> right. Oh, now I have to stop myself. Do sure. I know enough about this to make a decision, an informed choice? Yes. So it's a little complicated too. And that right. leads right in beautifully to the next proposal. Uh, okay. Do you want to go ahead and read it? It's a little tiny, teeny print. <laughs> sure. Well, it's the homestead in over overview. It's a, providing a homestead exemption on school property taxes. Um, the current current value is or cap is $40,000 and this proposes that that cap be raised to $100,000. So and that this is your wherever you live, whatever school district you live in, it's the school property taxes specifically. So portion. that portion. So I just want to be really clear about. So if you live in in the Dallas Independent School District, your your exemption would be raised to a hundred thousand dollars. If you live in Richardson, you know, or whatever suburb, um, then that's specific to that school district. So I just want to be really clear about that. Um, so that yeah, that is the uh, upshot of that. The benefit who would benefit from this is really owners of moderately priced homes. So those that are in the more mid-range, um, they would actually um, see the most benefit from this increase in the homestead exemption. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so it's, if you value that, then you're probably gonna be in favor of this. Um, on the other side, um, people feel like this gives no relief to the majority or to the one third of the people who are actually renters in the state of Texas, that this is very specific um, to property owners, to homeowners, and really does nothing to address um, what renters have. They get basically, you know, no relief. Um, and that the other side is that it you know, it shifts away um, from the schools. And so that's just a whole nother conversation about, um, because our, our whole school system is based on property taxes. That's how revenue comes in the whole system. So unless the people are willing to look at that whole system being revised, then again, this is the system, the framework in which we are operating. So yeah do you want the exemption to be increased or do you not, you know, basically that's kind of where it lands. I think you're right in terms of the um, folks who are in lower um, moderate homes. Um, and I wonder how much of this is a response, especially to people who are on fixed incomes, mm -hmm. um, small incomes, because all of our taxes are valued on this meteoric rise of house prices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And so the taxes have gone up. And um, um, I, I will say the one thing I appreciate about this is that it is on the homestead exemption um, yeah. and not just any property that you own. If you're a business person and you own real estate, business Absolutely. real estate, you own a second home, you own rental properties. Right. Mm -hmm. All of those are still taxed at the same rate. This is for your personal home. I researched homestead exemptions and I have a homestead exemption on uh, my mm -hmm. property taxes. Um, and I've watched my uh, condo double almost, it's getting close to triple in value. Um, and, um, and so the taxes have gone up and fortunately I feel like I can pay them. It's great, but not everybody feels like they can. And so, and so, and yet it takes, and so what I've heard, 
heard is that this, these, this budget surplus from the state of Texas is going to be used to fill out whatever decrease in property taxes they're, they, of income uh, to the cities or to the, to the school districts that that's, but I've only heard that. I haven't seen anything. I haven't seen anything in writing. I haven't seen any, you know, the legislature make an agreement about we're going to do this. And so that is clearly the offset. Um, right. And it does say that in the, um, I don't know if it was in the League of Women Voters or somewhere I read it, that um, I think it was $12 billion will be sent from the general revenue funds to school districts so that yeah. they can actually implement and lower the tax rate. Um, and so that would allow them then to actually implement the exemption. And it is true. It says it right here. The legislature has approved spending money to school districts to replace lost tax revenues. Mm -hmm. This money to be sent without counting towards spending limits in the Constitution. So, yes. so, so they have done that. Sorry, I misspoke. They have, ex in fact, done that. And this is for homes. Um, uh, 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 this is this that there's you know you have to get this and read this carefully because there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of fine print and these people are exempt and those people are not and so get those you know but overarchingly we've sort of talked about what this is about and it expires oh there's something about non-homesteaded properties such as business or second home cannot be more than 20 percent over the prior year's appraised value. So that's that's how they're keeping taxes lower on second homes and businesses is it can't go up by more than 20% per year, but it's only till December of 2026. So it's only for the next three years. Right. That particular piece of this proposition would, would time out, but the homestead exemption to $100,000 would, so there's actually two pieces to this legislation. Yes. The, it's the the one for the homestead exemption and one for not where 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 a property does not right and so you just have to take a minute oh wait that's another piece oh wait that's another piece okay do I really understand this and then you know listen to your heart think through in your mind ask yourself what's the what do you think are the benefits of it are and then you know we have to do the best we can in voting where we think I think we all do well how does that impact me Right. We ask that question. OK, I own a home. How does that how does that impact me and look at it from that viewpoint as well? Yes. Yes. And I would say I would say that's how most people do it. And I would say that you also have to think about how does it impact others? Yes, that's true. About implica implication, because it may be good for me, but it may actually not be good for this world that it works for everyone. I mean, somewhere along the line, we're going to have to start to be able to make these decisions, decisions that are actually good for everybody in a way that's not just, you know, it's that sort of not in my backyard kind of thing. And, you know, it's just like, I just find myself struggling with that. Because our spirituality says a world that works for everyone and lives that work for each of us. So we're always looking for that thing that is simultaneously. Yeah. And some of these are written in a very either or. It's either going to be good for me or it's going to be good for them. But well, yes, they become pretty black and white, right? So I yes, that is, that's absolutely true. And I think sometimes though you have to start like, well, what does this even mean to me? Like, yes. so you have to create some kind of context for yourself and then expand outward from there. Right. Right. And, and always then in alignment with values. Yes. I mean, what are the values? I mean, I lived in a Robin Hood school district for quite a while, which meant that there was so much value in the taxation of the homes and mm -hmm. the school made so, had so much money, so much more than other places where the school was in an area that had very low in uh, low valued homes and the money was transferred over and you know and and there were people who just hated that i loved it i thought it was great i thought it equalized things i thought it was really i mean we had so many benefits in the school district we were in and i knew of school districts that didn't have those kinds of benefits and 
And so, yeah, that those kinds of values, I mean, I really have to stop and think about those for myself and they can be in conflict. And then I have to, I have to take responsibility for what I'm choosing and say, I'm good with making this choice. And, you know, that's just being a grown up, right? So, well, yeah, and it's being informed. It's, you know, that's why I'm so, you know, I'm such a cheerleader for educating yourself and being informed and, yeah, because it is important. Yeah. It is important. Yeah. So if you're watching this, thanks for hanging in with us. If you're watching it after the live stream, you can, of course, click through as you get to um, other propositions that you're more interested in. We're at proposition number six. We are carrying on. The constitutional amendment creating the Texas Water Fund to assist. Oh, wait, we skipped number five, Petra. Oh, That's sorry, five. sorry, sorry. Yep. Oh, that yes. Five. Okay, this is the number five constitutional amendment relating to the Texas University Fund, which provides funding to certain institutions of higher education to achieve national prominence in major research universities and drive the state economy. So that's our, those are our uh, modifiers to the certain institutions achieving national prominence as either uh, as a major research university or drive the state economy, right? So it's not every university. Right. So what do we, uh, what do we understand about this? So uh, current, currently the university, just for some context, currently the University of Texas system and Texas A&M system are the only recognized research facilities for whatever, whoever makes those criteria. So right now, those two are the only, I guess, federally recognized um, research okay. facilities, which mm -hmm. then allows them to apply for grants and fundings that perhaps other systems could not, you know, be eligible for. So that's the overarching. Um, in 2009, uh, the state of Texas set up a national Re research university fund to provide research grants for other public universities. And there's those universities are currently Texas State, um, Texas Tech, the University of Houston, and the University of North Texas. So those universities are now part of this other national research university fund. Mm -hmm. So what they're proposing now is that some um, other universities, what some people might call the smaller tier universities, um, would be eligible for these additional research funds. And um, it's, you know, and they're tiered, it's, it's a little complicated, quite frankly. Um, but that that's over, that's the overarching. And what, what I find interesting is that it doesn't guarantee that anybody's eligible for research monies. It, the whole thing is based on potentially becoming eligible. So it's kind of opening the door for them to, I guess, um, have that status or that available to them, but it doesn't guarantee funding necessarily. And um, well, it also says the legislature has to approve funds every two years for yes. one of these two funds. And the one thing I really like about this is it standardizes performance me measures to evaluate whether a university program qualifies for a grant, mm -hmm. right? So um, people can, whatever that standard is, it's not now just for the top tier, but others can be right. really work to elevate that. Yes. Some of the arguments against it is it that it's still a, a nameable group. So instead of the, you know, the two, now it's eight. Well, yeah, an eight may be better than nine or two. And it's not necessarily, it's not just a blanket statement. Every university is going to be available to the for these. Um, okay. so, right. So is a little bit better than nothing, is um a little uncertainty better than not doing it all. Um yeah, it's a it's a it's a little bit complicated. And 
Um, and so this is one, you know, one to really re read exactly what's in this um, little, it's one page, every one of these in the League of Women Voters Texas brochure, which is a link on the description of this live stream. Every one of them is just one page. You just have to read one page, right? And try to parse out what are they talking about? What are they referring to? What's the pros? What's the cons? And then and then see where you land. I mean, this feels like it has some real potential, also has some confusion. Um, again, it's this whole constitution thing. Does it really have to be a constitutional thing? Well, in Texas, it does. So we just could get over that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'd, it could be, that could be the question. Should mm -hmm. this be in our constitution or not? Right. And maybe that's a different, even do I think this is a good idea or not? So if it's too confusing, you could frame the question that way for yourself, right? So however you might want to frame it, um, yeah, I'm always for investing money in education, period, end of sentence. So that feels like that's an investment, but that's just me. Those are the things I value. I think we should be investing in education in every way we can and a little bit's better than none or not right. enough. You know, right. that's again, that's just me. That's me personally. You have to see where you land personally. Right. And the other thing is that this is contingent on funding, like you said, being approved every two years by the Texas legislature. And what I know about that is that every Texas le legislature is different. Everyone has different priorities. Everyone, you know, so this could actually, if it's not funded, then there's little or no value to, you know, these universities being, you know, included to broadening the pool, so to speak. They actually have to, I think, in my opinion, have to make a commitment. If you're going to do this, then you actually have to fund it. So, yes, yeah, see, and the other side of that coin might be, but because they have to do it every two years, the money isn't going to be continually siphoned off into this if for some reason the program isn't working or if for some reason. Right doesn't have a surplus or it's not an automatic by God, this much money is going to be put there and it's not in the constitution. So there's no choice. Right. So you can see Sherry and I might be thinking about these things a little differently. We might land. Good. We don't, right. That's why we individually vote. We, and we talk about it and we hear, you know, it's like, Oh, what Sherry said, I hadn't really thought about that. Well, that's really interesting. And the minute she said, then I was like, ah, oh, but on the other hand, Right. And so this is why if you can have these conversations with people, it's not about trying to convince someone that the way you think about it is the right way to think about it. And they should vote that way. It's about the conversation, listening. Right. I listen to Sherry and I'm thinking, oh, man, I didn't even think about it that way because I have my lens. This is the way yeah, I'm thinking. I'll do. And Sherry does, too. She has her lens. Absolutely. Right. And now all of a sudden there's more there's more information on the table or, and, and I trust Sherry's heart. And I trust her spiritual growth and where she's coming from. So, so I pay attention. Oh, okay. Maybe I should hmm, I'll take that into consideration. So again, the other thing is I noticed some, um, I have the tendency in the past when I've felt like, okay, I really need to vote. I'm going to go vote. And I have no idea. Right. Then I start making snap decisions. Yeah. Maybe not the best way to go about it either. So, right. um, you know, I, and I read these, this whole thing, I read this whole thing, just those 14 pages, probably in an hour or so thought about them for a little while. It's not like we have to, um, you know, it's not like we're going to, we have to spend hours and hours and days and days on researching something. Right. Um, so when okay. it's also the benefit of early voting, because it gives you a nice time span to you know, to read up, to educate um, before you go to vote. Right. So. Good. Okay. Are we having fun yet? We're having fun. <laughs> okay, we're having fun. All right. This is going to be a very long live stream. So if you have jumped on here, we're talking about the Texas, the Texas, the 14 constitutional amendments that are going to be at the, on the Texas ballot on November 7th. And I have often not voted in these things. And I'm learning so much about how Texas works um, and how important these votes are and that we need to be using our, oh, sorry, my, my uh, iPad is continuing to try to go out. 
Nope. I'm going to move it to another plug. Um, that we need to educate ourselves and to choose, take responsibility for choosing. Otherwise, we're not taking responsibility for our citizenship and somebody else is doing it for us. So we're going to go through the rest of these. Some of them are pretty interesting. Some of them don't take very much time at all. All right. Number seven. No. Yes. Six. Number six. The constitutional amendment creating the Texas Water Fund to assist in financing water projects in this state. So it would provide grants and low interest loans for water projects across Texas. Uh, it's being set up to address concerns about not having enough water to meet the needs of Texas's rapidly growing population, which we've certainly seen in Phoenix. They simply stopped providing water for a whole, for a whole um, su new suburb. They just literally cut the water off because there was no water and they were keeping it in the city. Uh, the Texas Water Development Board will administer the fund. Uh, they're appointed by the government and they are uh, responsible for meeting the state's water needs so that Texans have access to clean and affordable water. So uh, what do we think about this? What are the arguments for and against, Sherry? Um, well, um, it would provide funding to help communities plan and implement projects um, to obtain new water supply sources to um, ensure, you know, future water availability to replace or repair aging pipes, which is probably an issue in almost every major city throughout, you know, Texas. Um, I know it certainly is here in Dallas. And um, and because it also, if those pipes are not maintained, it also is leaking. So we're also losing a lot of water as well. And so, and also to upgrade waste management uh, plants and water treatment plants. So it could be used for, for that. So all that is very positive. Um, the only real argument I saw against was that this is a drop in the bucket um, is, to how much they're willing to put in um, compared to what the need is. So, you know, you I guess you weigh that out. And for those that might not know, um, Texas is very fortunate in the regard that we actually have a $32 billion surplus. I mean, mm -hmm. that is unheard of in any, I think, as far as I know, in any other state in the nation. So, um, we actually have resources to address some of these major issues. So is, you know, I guess it's like, is well, $1 billion is a place to start, but couldn't we put more into it? So I think it would be the argument for a lot of people, but I think it would definitely be a step forward in the right direction. Well, and I think part of the reason we have so much surplus is we spent so much money um, uh, um, allowing the businesses and things to drive the, the decision-making, right? And we, we provide so little money for things that, that the local citizen and the average person needs. And that's where I see the, the biggest um, imbalance. Um, and so I see that they're addressing some of these. I also saw one of the arguments for is that it would take state funds to fund local water projects. Yeah, why not? Wouldn't you want all the local water projects to work? Don't you want the smaller communities to really up level? Don't you want, you know, our major metropolitan areas not to have, you know, some horrible outbreak of wastewater or all of a sudden no water in the middle of the summer because half the pipes are broken? Yeah. I mean, what I mean, then to me, that's what we're that's why we're part of larger systems. That's yeah. why the city is part of a county, the county is part of a state, and quite frankly, the state is part of a nation. And when we, you know, cross our arms and say, no, we're going to do it our own way, we, you know, we can't, or we can't give those people money. It was a little bit harking back to that Robin Hood conversation we just had about the schools. And then it's all about me, me and my needs and what I think and I, you know, and not sharing it with others and our all of our little all of our local states and communities we're all part of Texas why shouldn't we benefit from this huge surplus right well and yeah and then it comes down to the distribution of resources and a lot of our smaller cities and towns don't have that property tax base right. to 
to do, you know, maintenance and infrastructure uh, right. like needs to be done. So why not draw from the bigger pool? Absolutely. Yeah, and then everybody moves into the city and the city gets worse and the towns die. Why mm -hmm. not reinvest in the towns, reinvest in this? In, and it just, yeah, this, yeah, so. These are values. Do you see? This is this is us thinking about our values, the things that we think are important, and the way that that out pictures. This, for me, begin, is really in alignment with the world that works for everyone. And even if it's not enough, water is becoming a clear resource issue everywhere in the world, everywhere in the United States, and we are going to have to figure it out. Um, and we're going to have to we're going to have to help each other. So that's where that's the kind of thinking, right? And even right. if it's not enough, I, it, I don't see anything in the proposition that says how much it actually is. Um, um, uh, how but much we, is it going into the fund? Uh, 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 but that's one of the arguments against is it's just not it's, enough. It was it's one billion dollars. Oh, okay, it's one billion, and so you know. Well, one is a, I mean, it's a huge sum of money, but probably when you're looking at the scope of what potentiality it's like yeah it's a drop in the bucket so but you know you got to start somewhere right? sure, exactly okay proposition seven the constitutional amendment providing for the creation of the texas energy fund to support the construction maintenance modernization and operation of electric generating facilities this would allow for this fund money to be put in the fund by the legislature, and it would be used by the Public Utility Commission to, fight, to, to, to provide loans and grants to companies to build or upgrade electric generating plants in Texas. Sounds great, right? Except. <laughs> Aha, except for the fine print. <laughs> except for the fine print, right? Only if they are natural gas plants. Yes. Natural not powered electric plants. Yes. Is the focus. yes. Sorry, good. No, so that I mean, that's really important um, because who wouldn't want before, you know, reliable energy grid and and all of that. So, yeah, on face value. Absolutely. And then when you see that it truly is to primarily fund natural gas powered electric plants, that's where I think the um, the conversation will be interesting because those plants, as we know, can often be the most expensive um, to create and operate and the most harmful to the environment. Um, and that they're, it, most importantly for me, this does not include any solar or wind powered projects. They're not eligible for the loans or grants. And they currently generate about 39% of our energy in the state of Texas. So to me, that's like, hmm, yeah, it's just very interesting. It feels like it's supporting the status quo and the status quo has not served us well as, as a state um, in, as we've seen in the last couple of years during severe weather um, crisis, either, either in the summer or in the winter. Well, yes, and I also read it as um, natural gas. You still have to buy from somebody, so somebody's making money. So oh, there's somebody, there's another place where money is being made. Mm -hmm. um, wind and solar are free, so you just have to build it. You build it, you maintain it. An electric, a, a natural gas, you build it, maintain it, but you have to keep buying natural gas to pay for your electricity. And natural gas is not environmentally friendly. It really is not. And so in principle, the idea is great. And because I know Texas has surprisingly enough, a huge commitment to solar and wind energy. It's just not talked about because we live in an oil and gas um, business environment. And I find the whole thing fascinating. Um, and so, yes, the, that's why you have to read the fine print. Who, who who would get these loans and grants? Interestingly enough, in the in the fine print of the of the um, the one we were just read about in terms of the institutions, right? There's actually an expansion of institutions. Maybe it doesn't include any everybody, but there's an expansion of institutions. And here, it's very much targeted to a particular type of electrical generating. 
Um, so we all need electricity. We need a lot of electricity. It's ridiculous how many things I have plugged in all the time and how many times when I travel, how many cords I bring around. Oh my God, 47 million devices. And yet we, we have to take responsibility, right, for the choices that we vote for because it's impacting our environment over and over and over again. This, we have to, that's a world that works for everyone. Yeah. I have to think about that, right? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Proposition eight, the constitutional amendment creating the broad broadband infrastructure fund to expand high-speed broadband access and assist in the financing of connectivity projects. I will say, I see that all these funds being created. I do wonder if it's because there's so much surplus and they want to find a way to use it and they do want to find a way to use it in specific areas that are of need. Certainly electricity, water's of need, education's of need. Um, broadband infrastructure is of need. I mean, let's, you know, that's also actually pretty cool. Um, and so whether or not they should be amendments or policies is an immaterial conversation because this, this is, this is the way it is done in Texas. Constitutional amendments have to be made. It's the only way that these kinds of things um, get to be put for forward. If you're from California or some of the places that have referendums, it's not available to us in Texas. Um, and so that's why they have to be carefully parsed and understood. We always have to ask, where's the money? Who's the, who's the beneficiaries? Where's the money coming from? You know, follow the money and you'll know what's really going on. To the best of our ability, we try to educate ourselves. So okay. yeah, broadband infrastructure. What do so you think? this again, this is one of those funds that would end in 10 years. So it's a limited, limited creation. Um it, interesting that um on the 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 cons of the argument is that the private sector is already doing this. So the state doesn't really need to be doing this because the private sector is already doing this um, in underserved areas. And that it doesn't, um, one of the downsides to this is that it doesn't pri prioritize need. Um, so it's like, who's going to decide where, right. where this goes and when and, and all of that. So that was the only thing I saw on the, um, on the other side is that it's already being done. And so why does, why does the government need to do it and use funds that could be used elsewhere? Um, for this particular uh, need. Yes, on the other hand, it does say including areas where primary co private companies are not currently mm -hmm. operating, right? right. I mean, one would want this to, one would want a proposition to, I would want a proposition here to make that priority, yes. right? prioritize where it's not. I mean, I can see the value of using state funds. There is a large surplus, 10 years. Okay, I would think in 10 years, the, every household in the state could be connected. Mm -hmm. I mean, just in our cabin in the woods, in our cabin in the woods, in the middle of nowhere, the state of New Hampshire, everybody who has electricity will have um, broadband um, if you, if it's not already in your area by, you know, by the private companies, it just, and there's, and that funding was both New Hampshire and the federal government. There is federal government funding. Right. There's partnerships. Yes. And that's the other thing that's in here it gives access to that federal funding. If they'll put money toward it, then they get access to the federal funding. I do believe that the federal funding has some um, prioritization towards rural areas, areas where there isn't as much, right? So if they are partnering, that could provide some of the prioritizing. Um, and um, yeah, so again, on the face of it seems incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. Do the do the 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 the, uh, the things that either aren't included or are um, against? Do they weigh heavily enough to say this isn't the this isn't the right constitutional amendment? This isn't structured properly. That would be an that would be a, a valuable question that someone could ask themselves. 
Right. And the other thing that was on my mind is who's going to administer this fund. I didn't see that referenced anywhere. So now I've made myself a note to go back and look like who's actually going to like for the water fund, the Texas Water Board will administer it. But who would administer this particular fund? So I'm right. and, like and myself it to do the um, Texas Education Fund. And it said that about the, the um, energy fund. But right. you're right. It doesn't say it here. Right. So. Uh -huh. OK. One more thing to research. One more thing to research. Okay, Proposition 9, the constitutional amendment authorizes the 88th legislature to provide a cost of living adjustment to certain annuity annuitants of the teacher retirement system of Texas. So there was a one-time cost of living for in 2020, wait a minute, they, in 2023, um, and this would now start in 2024. Mm -hmm. It's still a single, another, it's a one-time extra payment and live cost of living adjustment. Correct. Um, so, does it, um, yeah, so the ones against, again, or it's not enough. It's not enough money. Right. And it does yeah, not address teacher mm -hmm. shortage. Right. And that it doesn't. Um, yeah, I think that concern is it's what sometimes we tend to do in the state of Texas is do a one off rather than addressing the core long term issue. And um, yeah, I mean, it's great. They're going to get basically one extra payment. And again, it's a one off. It's not even right. a we're going to adjust your the adjust of co the cost of living adjustments to make them actually work so we don't have to do this every time exactly well it's like people on social security get a cost of living raise increase but that's that's like for all the you know for the whole year it's not just like one extra payment right and so that's the difference in it's, in and this isn't it automatic every year that cost of living increase is that all that they decide is how much it is but it's automatic every year in social security yes because it's tied yes yes right. right so so that seems to make a whole lot more sense to me if right. we are instead of every year, somebody has to, I mean, we could have, you know, we could have dozens and dozens more constitutional amendment, the 88, 89th legislature, the 90th legislature, right. make, this, make this decision, make this decision, you know. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it seems. Again, it really doesn't solve the long-term problem. I mean, it's, yes, it, it's great. And and it doesn't really solve the long-term problem no. issue no. for, for retired teachers and other staff. It's not just teachers, it's other staff that's um, might've retired from the school district. Right, so. and, and does it, and it doesn't address needing more teachers, period. Correct. So it does a lot of issues, um, right. which, you know, and, and, and does anybody want to say, no, they can't have more money because of course the cost of living is in fact going up. Sure, and yeah. It, the challenge, right? Would you want to say no because it doesn't address the underlying issues, or do you want to give them the raise that they need and say this? We have to do something. We have to do better. Right, and then lobby. Yeah, exactly. Hard to know, but it shouldn't keep us from voting. It'd be a both and. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. It and we have Sometimes it has to be a short-term solution, and then you actually have to go lobby and work for the long-term solution. So, right. All right, we're going to zip through some of the rest of these because we've been on here a long time, Sherry. Thanks for your time, and I hope this is of help. And also, I hope it. I hope it's helping you think through these amendments. Right. That's part of what we. I mean, we have not rehearsed any of this. We're just talking about the amendments. And what they mean and what they say and where do we go from here? So um, we only have a few more to look at. Number yep. 10, the constitutional amendment to authorize, oh, more taxation. I can't even pronounce it. The legislature to exempt from ad valorem taxation equipment or inventory held by a manufacturer for medical or biomedical products to protect the Texas healthcare network and strengthen our medical supply chains. Okay, holy moly. Uh, it feels very um, industry specific. 
It is very industry specific. It's um, and Texas is one of a few states that uh, applies a property tax on the equipment and inventory of medical and biomedical companies. So this is the, the argument for this, I guess, is that these are vital com companies to any economy, especially, you know, post COVID and um, what we went through in, during the pandemic. And um, the taxes on the other property of this, these companies would remain the same. It's only on their inventory and their equipment. Um, and we are, like I said, one of the few states that still continues to tax that. See, and that's important information, right? Mm -hmm. that, that there is a precedent for people making this decision, that they think this is a good decision. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's an important piece of information. Um, to think through, not, not just be, not like my mother would say, well, if they jumped off the bridge, would you follow them? <laughs> right, right. Um, but it is actually an important piece of information that I didn't know. So there you go. So again, it's a specific, it's not only specific to a, like the childcare, specific to certain industry, but then it's also a, a specific to a certain portion of their property. Right. Of so that's also really interesting to pay attention to. Yeah. Okay. Interesting one to think about. Number 11, the Constitution Amendment authorizing the legislature to permit conservation and reclamation districts in El Paso I'm County, oops, sorry, to issue bond bonds supported by an ad valorem tax to fund the development and maintenance of parks and recreational facilities. So, so the, why are we as a state voting on something having to do with El Paso County. Do we know? We do because this is one of the quirks of the Texas Constitution. Um, so in 2003, the Constitution was amended to give conservation and reclamation districts in 11 counties in Texas, again, very specific, the ability to issue bonds to fund the development and maintenance of parks and recreation facilities. El Paso County was not one of those counties. And so now they're asking to be included because they want the ability to fund their parks system because they believe it's underfunded. So it's pretty straightforward request on their part. They want to be able to have this like these 11 other counties. Currently. They just want to be added to the list. Exactly. Great. So you can decide, do you want to have Paso on the list or not? Yeah. <laughs> and then again, they still have to, the, the voters in that just in El Paso still have to approve it. It's, so it's just it's us giving our blessing, at, like go for it, El Paso or whatever. <laughs> we think yeah. that you can be on the list. Yeah. Is it creating a world that works for everyone and lives that work for each of us? Parks and recreation? <laughs> well, I know my answer, but you have to make yeah. your answer. Right. Okay. Proposition 12, the constitutional amendment providing for the Ab abolition of the office of county treasurer once again in Galveston County. Why is Texas interested? Why are we as voters in Texas voting on this issue in Galveston County? Because we... once again, in their infinite wisdom, the Texas Constitution provides that the office of the county treasurer can be abolished via an amendment. So, um, other counties, there is precedent. Other counties have done this. Collin County's done it. Tarrant County's done it. Uh, abolished their office of county treasurer. And so now the county of Galveston is asking that they be allowed to abolish theirs. Interestingly enough, the current um, treasurer ran um, his whole campaign in 2022 based on abolishing the office. So, um, yeah, so, and once again, the voters in Galveston would have to vote this up or down once it's passed. So, so, so are we giving them permission to make yes. that vote? Yes. So, so can go ahead and make that vote. Yes. We think you should make that vote. We don't care one way or the other. So, we're go for it. Yeah. If you don't want a treasure, go for it. Yeah. yeah. We're leaving it up to you. We're not making, we're not making it mandatory that you have one. Correct. Okay. Give them choice. Exactly. Local okay. choice, right? Local, what impacts you at the local level? Right. See, now, if we hadn't talked about that, I would not have understood that that's what this amendment was about. 
-hmm. I would have read it a little bit differently. And so that's why it's so helpful to educate ourselves. All right, down to the last two. You're, thanks for hanging in. And I hope this is helpful to you. It's great to do this conversation with uh, Sherry. The reason that we're talking about it again is because there are 14 amendments on the November 7th ballot in Texas. Did you know that? I didn't know that until just a couple of weeks ago. And I have not always voted in these elections. And that is to my shame and embarrassment that I haven't taken responsibility as a citizen for my choices. And I haven't exercised those. And I'm learning from our spiritual spirituality, democracy, and advocacy work that we're doing here at CSL Dallas that it is important. And if I'm not doing that, I am not living our global vision, a world that works for everyone and lives that work for each of us. And so that's why we're going through this, because I don't know anything about this. Sherry's my go-to person. She's the one who researches it. She's been a part of this whole political process for decades and has a clue as to the craziness to this whole constitutional amendment thing in Texas. Um, and so we're down to the last two. And I hope this has been as helpful to you as it is to me. Okay, I'm opening my little thing here again. Here we go. Number th 13. A constitutional amendment to increase the mandatory age of retirement for state judges, justices, and judges to increase, meaning to make it older. Yes. Right. Right. Um, it, it, and now uh, it currently requires uh, somebody to end their term at 75. Correct. And the legislature can lower it, but not less than 70. Um, and having to do with the, if they're elected and their term goes beyond their 75th birthday, they have to go, they have to leave. Proposition 13 would move it to the state judge to 79. And then the, the lower age, which the legislature could set, could be no less than 75. And uh, repeal the requirement of mandatory retirement if you're in a six-year term and you and you cross the you know the line of re mandatory requirements. It's so it's just so interesting to me that um, yeah I I am um, I find this problematic, and um, I find it problematic how long some of our um, elected officials and some of our judges are in their positions um, with no opportunity for change. And, um, um, and I find it problematic for people to be operating at this level. Um, and with, yeah, so with the, you know, do we think somebody is going to be fully engaged all the way up until 79? um that's an interesting yeah that's well it is an interesting question and um this again the fine print they can still in texas they can still serve as visiting judges so if they wanted to continue to reserve you know serve past 75 they can absolutely do that there's no you know limit on that at all and it, People are called on to be visiting judges, you know, quite frequently. So that's also an option to be aware of. And, you know, the increasing, like to your point, Petra, you know, it doesn't reflect the demographics of a younger population, right? And so that's also something to consider. Yeah, it's, I think a significant, um, because so many people that are moving in are moving in at working age, right? Mm -hmm. And they're young families and they, you know, that Texas has gone after the business market and brought in a ton of corporations and a ton of people. People are moving in by the droves. Um, and many of them are in what we would consider the householder phase, right? They've got kids, they've got kids in school, um, or they're young professionals with no children. Um, and it's a very different demographic. And um, so, things to think about, you know, do we feel like, oh, that's ageist. Um, certainly there are people that are 79 years old who could function this way. And yet, is there, is it, is it in alignment with what you think that you, how you think this might be? Um, so uh, not so cut and dried, right? Yeah. Some of these are not so cut and dried and they really do have to do with your values, how you think it will affect you and how you think it will affect others. 
Um, and um, we know that, you know, a lot of families are, in fact, moving into um, rural areas, smaller towns. They're trying to get out of the big cities. And so, yeah, it's all things to think about and weigh in the balance. But do vote. Do vote. Make a choice. Take responsibility for the fact that you've thought about it and you're, do you're doing the best you can, even if you don't know whether it's the right the right answer, right? Think about your values, feel into your heart, listen to your intuition and make a choice. Okay, finally, the constitutional amendment providing for the creation of a Centennial Parks Conservation Fund. Oh, another fund <laughs> to be used for the creation and improvement of state parks. Um, so it's up to 1 billion of the surplus and other sources to create these parks, a dedicated pool of money to buy land for the creation and improvement of parks, um, because we, you know, because of the diverse wildlife, natural landscape, important cultural and historical sites, et cetera, et cetera. Um, more than 95% of land in Texas is privately owned, and every year land is getting more expensive to buy. I mean, yeah, I mean, for me, this is like, yeah, a kind of a no brainer in terms of um, allocation of resources. And I think, you know, there was a somewhat of a debacle last year with um, down in Fairfield with that state park and that might be the, what precipitated all this is to have an actual dedicated pool of money that can be used, you know, specifically for parks and the, the buying of land and um, because yeah it's, it's a natural resource you know that we have and that that truly is in service to the whole population. Right. right, our parks are in service to the whole population, not just a few or a handful of people. So, and, and, and even Dallas itself has discovered that if you want to be an international cosmopolitan city on the international stage, you have to have a downtown that is that is pedestrian friendly, walkable. Families want to live there. They want to do stuff with their kids. You want to bring corporations in here. Those people are coming with their kids. They want to know where are they going to go? What are they going to do with their kids, right? And even if you don't have children, um, that, again, how does it impact the whole? And I think, Sherry, as you said, the natural resources belong to all of us. Right. And because so much land is privately owned and the point is well taken, it's getting more and more and more expensive. It is. Uh, and, and to set aside valuable and beautiful land um, for all of us, you know, a world that works for everyone. And certainly in our global vision, the natural world is very, very, very high on our list of priorities. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and so, yeah. So, um, and, and did you catch that Sherry knew something about a park last year and where was it? Fairfield. Fairfield. Uh -huh. why you need friends like Sherry or other people <laughs> who actually are this, you know, and there's that delicate balance. We don't want to be inundated with the news, but we actually want to pay attention. We want to be able to learn about things. We want to understand the implications of things. We are smart enough. Don't let media or anybody else or education or anybody else dumb everything down for us or for you. We are completely capable. Yes. Taking a few minutes to understand this or taking an hour and a half. So here we go. Sherry, thank you. Thanks You're for so welcome. Thank you for the conversation. Thanks for um, um, uh, educating so many of us. My pleasure. It's, it's what I'm passionate about. I love it. Yeah, Be involved. Be yes. involved. Yes. Yes. And it's, and it's good to exercise our brains and to exercise our hearts and our values. We all, we all have competing values. Ultimately, we have to make choices based on those values that that rise to the top in any particular situation and that rise to the top when we're thinking about a world that works for everyone and lives that work for us. These things are not mutually exclusive. Sometimes we make one or the other primary, but they must overarchingly play together. Absolutely. Sherry, so grateful for you. Thank you, Peter. Last words of wisdom for us. 
go vote. Polls are open today and uh, until November 3rd. Um, polls will be open on November 7th from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So find your local polling place and go vote. Mm -hmm. or, or you can mail in vote. Yes. Uh, but the mail in yeah. vote has to be in, has to be in by the 7th, right? It has to have the stamp on it that it was mailed by the 7th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Postmark by the 7th. So all of the above. All right, Sherry, I just love doing this with you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. What a treat. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh-huh. Bye-bye.